Today, we will start our discussion of what is known as the determinant of a square matrix, but we'll do it differently than the standard textbooks. Introduce a new product of vectors, which we'll call the wedge product. And what we want that product to be is given two vectors, A and B, we'd like this product to somehow or other compute the area of the parallelogram associated with A and B. We'll call that A wedge B. So the question is, what properties should such a product have? Let's start discussing what we might see. So look at the figure first. Suppose I take my area defined by A and B, A wedge B, and let me scale that vector A, let's say by a factor of 2. So instead of A, I'll look at 2A. Then 2A wedged with B, well, that's A wedged with B on the left, and a wedge with B on the right, that should just be twice the area as before. So what we are going to posit, therefore, is that alpha times A, if I scale a vector A by alpha, and wedge it with B, the result should be just alpha times the result of wedging A with B. Here, alpha was 2. Scaling the vector A by a factor of 2 simply scaled the area by a factor of 2. The same applies for the vector b. We'll have the same rule for a scale factor with b. We can just pull out a constant alpha from alpha a, or a constant beta from beta b, and we can dispense with the parenthesis and simply write alpha a wedge b, or beta a wedge b, as the case may be. Now that we've done that, let's plug in some special numbers. If I plug in alpha equals 1, well, 1 times a is a, so 1 times a wedge b is equal to 1 times a wedge b. That makes perfect sense. But how about 0? If we think of shrinking a, making a smaller, then that area is going to shrink, and eventually, by the time a is equal to the 0 vector, the area will have shrunk to 0. So the special case alpha equals 0 simply says that 0 a wedge b equals 0, and we get that a wedged with the 0 vector is equal to 0, 0 wedged with the b vector is equal to 0. So if one of the vectors or both of the vectors are 0, the net area is equal to 0. How about minus 1? Well, if I change alpha to minus 1, I get that minus a wedge b is equal to minus 1 times the area a wedge b. Let's look at the figure. If I look at a wedge b, that's the area on the right. If I look at minus a wedge b, that's the area on the left. But those two areas should be the same, and I find a minus sign. So there is a minus sign that can be associated with an area. We are talking about an algebraic area, not a geometric area. To get the geometric area, we'll have to take absolute values. So how should we interpret that minus sign? Well, the way that's going to work nicely is to simply talk about the orientation as we walk around the perimeter. In A wedge B, what we'll say is we'll first walk along the A vector and then along the B vector and then complete the circuit, keeping the area on our left. That's going to be a plus sign. Similarly, if I first walk around that perimeter by walking along the minus a vector followed by the b vector, I keep the area to my right. That's going to be the counterclockwise orientation. It's going to be a minus sign. So clockwise is going to be the a minus sign. Counterclockwise is going to be plus sign. Another consequence that I can derive from this, suppose I walk along b first and then along a. So I'm walking in the opposite direction along the perimeter of A wedge B. B wedge A has opposite orientation from A wedge B, but it's the same geometric area. So what we'll set therefore is that A wedge B is equal to minus B wedge A. Our product is anti-commutative. Interchanging A and B in the wedge product forces a sign change. And that's going to put a heck of a lot of plus and minus signs into our computations. Now let's look at the special case when A is equal to B. Well, A wedge A equals minus A wedge A in that case. A positive number equals to a negative number. A wedge A is going to be zero. 
a of j equals zero. Let's think about the area here for a moment. Let's take that b vector and pull it down onto the a vector. So that parallelogram is going to get flatter and flatter, and eventually when the b vector is equal to the a vector, the net area of the parallelogram is equal to zero. Next, let's look at the area of a parallelogram again. I've drawn two parallelograms here, the first one here, and then a second one where I took the a vector and I displaced it parallel to itself. The areas of those two parallelograms uh, from geometry, we know that they're equal. If I take the vector a and I slide it along parallel to itself, I'm distorting the parallelogram, but I'm not changing the area of those parallelograms. Let's look at the composite parallelogram here, the vector a at the bottom, and a vector that I'll split into two, a vector b plus c on the side. So I start out with my parallelogram, a wedged with a vector split into b plus c, and I'm going to now transform both of these parallelograms. I'll grab the a vector that separates the two parallelograms and pull it out parallel to itself. The result is two parallelograms. The parallelogram a veg b, the tan one at the bottom, and the parallelogram a veg c, the gray one at the top. And what I see, therefore, is that the gray areas haven't changed, they're the same areas, and the tan areas haven't changed, they are the same areas. And so what I'm going to set, therefore, is that a veg b plus c is equal to a veg b plus a veg c. Our wedge product distributes over the sum. Now, how about more vectors? I could construct volumes by simply trying to apply the exact same reasoning as before. So I'm going to look at wedge products of more than two vectors. So a1, wedge a2, wedge a3, all the way to some number k. And I'm going to give a name to such expression. I'll call it a blade, or if I want to emphasize how many vectors there are in that wedge product, a k blade. The way to think about blades is with a single vector, it's just our standard vector, a1. With two vectors, it's a piece in a plane. As I add more and more vectors in my blade, I'm going to be talking about volumes in more dimensions, so let's call them hypervolumes. So a blade represents a hypervolume in general. To generalize from our wedge product with two vectors, we'll simply make the product associative. Similarly, if I have a vector that is scaled, I'll expand that as well. I'll keep the distributivity, and as I add more and more vectors, I'll just expand on those definitions accordingly. Now let's play with blades a little bit. Let's try and understand better how they work. So let's talk about moving vectors in a plane. Here I've written an example with a four blade. I have a1, veg a2, veg a3, veg a4. Let's group a1 and a2 and interchange a1 and a2. That picks up a minus sign. Now let's group a1 and a3 and interchange a1 and a3. That picks up another minus sign. So the net effect is plus. Interchange a1 and a4 picks up a minus sign again. So as a1 migrates from left to right, each time I interchange a1 with the vector adjacent to it, I pick up another minus sign, and the net effect is going to be an alternating set of signs, plus 1, minus 1, plus 1, minus 1. If I combine moving a1 to the right, let's say into the position that a4 is currently in, and moving a4 back into the position that a1 started in, I'm interchanging a1 and a4. Let's see how that one works. So I have a1, a2, a3, a4, and I want to interchange the a1 with the a4. Start with the a4. Move it right next to a1. So it's going to move over a3, minus sign, move over a2, now it's a plus sign. So overall, it's plus a1, a4, a2, a3, a5. Now interchange a1 and a4. That's going to pick up a minus sign. And finally, put a1 back into the place where a4 came from, so it has to hop over the same number of entries that a4 had to hop over. 
and that happens to be a plus sign in this case. But overall, if there's a hops to go back and one hop to interchange the two vectors, the net effect of an interchange is always going to be a sign change. It's always going to be minus one. Another case that's interesting is what happens if a vector appears more than once? Well, a1, a2, and here I have a2 appearing a second time. So what I'll do is I'll move them next to each other. There's going to be a certain number of sign changes. But once I have them next to each other, if I group them, a2 veg a2, that's the same vector. That's the zero vector. So the net effect is if I have the same vector appearing more than once, even if they're not adjacent, the net effect is that the overall veg product is equal to zero. Let's expand on that a little bit and say one vector has here a2 plus another vector in it, b, and that b also appears as a remaining vector. Then when I use my distributivity property, I break this into two terms, into the term that has the a2 only, so a1, a2, a3, a4, b, and the term that has b only, so plus a1, b, a3, a4, and b. The repeated term is going to cancel, and I'm left with a1, a2, a3, a4, and b. So if I have that b occurring more than once, I can cancel it out. I can filter it away. So a repeated vector, even if it's in a sum of vectors, it simply cancels. You can remove it. The next step, let's do some algebraic computations. And the way the rules went, we found that the rules are very similar to scalar algebra, with the proviso that two things. If I interchange two vectors, I get a sign change. And if I repeat vectors, well, repeated vectors in a blade simplify to zero. So let's look at what happens with two vectors. Let me take the vector A, 4e1 plus 2e2, the vector b, that's 3 1 minus e2, and wedge them together, so a wedge b. And now simply apply algebra the way we are used to, just being careful about the order. So break that first vector into two. 4e1 times the second vector, 2e2 wedged into the second vector. So 4e1 wedged into the second vector, 2e2 wedged into the second vector. And now Break the second vector into 2. So 3e1, uh, that's 3 times 4 is 12e1e1. Oh, e1e1 is repeated, that's 0. Minus 4e1e2, well, that stays. Plus 2 times 3 is 6, e2 veg e1. And then minus 2, e2 veg e2. Well, e2 is repeated, so that term is equal to 0. I'm left with minus 4 e1 veg e2 plus 6 e2 veg e1. Oh, let's make them look the same by interchanging e2 and e1, putting them in numerical order. That changes the sign to a minus sign, and I get minus 10 e1 veg e2 out of this. If I look at the interpretation, I have my original veg product a and b, and I've actually drawn the vectors to scale on a grid, I see a clockwise orientation for A veg B, and find that A veg B is equal to minus 10 times E1 veg E2. I'm comparing the area of A veg B with the area of E1 E2. I found that they have opposite orientation, and that the area of A wedge B is 10 times as large as the area of E1, E2. So I found the area of the parallelogram defined by A and B with respect to the area of the parallelogram defined by E1, E2. The notation is going to be a bit easier to read if we introduce subscripts. Instead of writing E2 wedge E1, I'll simply write E with a subscript 2 and a subscript 1 in the order in which the terms appear in the wedge block. So my result was A wedge B is equal to minus 10 E1 E2. The area of the parallelogram defined by A and B is minus 10 times the area defined by a reference parallelogram E1 E2. The minus sign 
the areas have opposite orientation. As a second example, let's take two vectors, but let's say they have three components this time. And I want to compute A veg B. And again, I multiply everything out in the exact same way. And I get, this time it doesn't simplify. This time I have an E13 term, so a coordinate plane E1 and E3, a plane E1, E2, and a plane E2, E3. I'll have split my original area into three areas, one in, if the E's are my coordinate vectors, one in each coordinate plane. So I'll look back at my figure here. There's nothing in the algebra, in our definitions, that say that I have to pull that vector out parallel to itself in the same plane. I could pull it out parallel to itself in free space. So think of this as the side over here is above the area in the plane that I'd started with. That is the decomposition that we just achieved. So the A wedge B plus C because A wedge B plus A wedge C didn't require the vectors to be coplanar. Now interpretation, the cross product has the exact same properties as this wedge product. So if I compute A cross B in the exact same way, I'll get A cross B as minus seven E1 cross E3 minus six E1 cross E2 minus two E2 cross E3. But the cross product adds one more property. It says that instead of describing a plane the way we have, I'm going to describe a plane by the vector orthogonal to the plane. And on top of that, I'm going to introduce a right hand row. So E1 veg E2 is going to be the orthogonal vector is E3. E2 veg E3, the orthogonal vector is E1. And E3 veg E1, the orthogonal vector is set equal to 2. Look at the numerical order as I run around the circle, 1, 2, 3, 1 and 2 gives me 3, 2 and 3 gives me 1, 3 and 1 gives me 2. That's my right hand rule coming in. So adding this property, I get that A cross B is equal to the minus 7 E1 cross E3. That's plus E3 cross E1 and E3 cross E1 we define to be E2, so plus 7 E2. Minus six times, this is E3. Minus two times, this is E1 again. Reordering, it's minus two E1 plus 72 minus six E3. So the cross product only works in 3D. Our veg product, since we don't do this transformation, since we don't replace a plane with a vector orthogonal to a plane, works in any number of dimensions. So it is a more general notion that proves to be advantageous. Here's an example with three vectors. So I take A, B, and C, I wedge them together, and as I go, I do my exact same expansion as before, being very careful to keep the order the same. And whenever I interchange vectors, I pick up a minus sign. And you can follow that computation along, but in the end, what we see is that all of the vectors combine into a single term, minus 18, E1, E2, E3. When you think about it, that had to happen. Because when I take this wedge product, E1, if I pick that E1 term and wedge it in, I'll have E1 wedged with E1 will drop out. And so I'll have to pick from E2 and E3 for my next vector. E1, let's say I pick E2. E1 veg E2, therefore I have both E1 and E2 appearing, so E1 and E2 drop out, I'll only be able to get a non-zero entry from E3. So it's going to be E1 veg E2 veg E3, or the other choice, E1 veg E3 veg E2. In each one of the cases, whichever vector I start with, I have to pick the remaining two vectors. I'll have a single term E1, E2 through, well, in general, if I have K vectors expanded into K vectors E, I will pick up a single term E1, E2, EK. Now, one other thing we'll do. We have a choice as to how we want to order these. 
let's simply agree to always order them in numerical order. So E1 wedged with E2 wedged with E3. Well, let's look at the general case. So I'm going to pick up three vectors and I'm going to set them equal to alpha 1 E1 plus alpha 2 E2 plus alpha 3 E3 for A1 E1 plus A2 E2 plus A3 E3 for the first vector. B1, B2, B3 components for the second vector, C1, C2, C3 components for the third vector, and let me wedge them together. And the thing to notice is that the patterns will only depend on the locations of the entries A, B, and C in the matrix of coefficients. So let's compare what happens to my wedge product on the left with what happens with the coefficients of the entries on the right. Let's proceed. Let's pick the first vector, A1, E1, and wedge it into the remaining vectors. Well, the moment I've picked A1, E1, I can't pick B1, E1 or C1, E1 anymore. So A1, E1 will be wedged into the remaining two vectors with the B1s and C1s dropped out. So into the wedge product of B2E2 plus B3E3 and C2E2 plus C3E3. That's a wedge product of two vectors written in terms of E2 and E3. In terms of the coefficients, therefore, I have picked A1, and what I do is I get to erase the remainder of the row that A1 is in. I get to erase the remainder of the column that the A1 is in, and simply look at the remaining entries, at the remaining submatrix. Let's do the next step. So A1 is E1 times the wedge product of those two vectors. And when I compute that wedge product, E2, E3, and E3, E2, putting them in numerical order picks up a minus sign. So I get A1, B2, C3, minus B3, C2, times the wedge product E1 wedged with E2, E3. Comparing here, I see that I have to pick A1, and I have to multiply it with B2, C3 minus B3, E2. Okay, we are done with the A1, E1 term. Let's go to the A2, E2 term. The A2, E2 term in my wedge product, well, now I've picked from my first vector, if I pick an E2 vector underneath, that only contributes 0. So I'll take A2, E2, wedged with B1, E1, B3, E3, C1, E1, C3, E3. If I compute that wedge product and put things in numerical order, I'll get B1, C3, minus B3, C1. The E's, the wedge product, is E2 wedged with E1, E3. Putting that in numerical order picks up a minus sign again. So over here in the matrix product, I see what I'm going to get when I reorder that. I'm going to get a minus sign, minus A2 times B1C3 minus C1B3. The terms that I get when I take the row that A2 is in and erase it, the column that A2 is in and erase it, and compute the wedge product that's left, B1, C3, minus B3, C1. Let's go for the third vector. A3, E3, wedged into, well, B3, E3, and C3, E3 won't enter anymore, wedged into the product B1, E1, plus B2, E2, wedged into C1, E1, plus C2, E2. In terms of the matrix, it's A3, erase the row and column that A3 is in, the product that I get from B1, B2, C1, C2. If I carry that out with the wedge product, I see the numerical coefficients times E3 wedged with E1, E2. I see that E3 wedge E1, E2, to put that in numerical order, E3 has to go across E1 and across E2. So two minus signs, I'm going to pick up a plus sign again. I see this alternating pattern of the signs plus A1, minus A2, plus A3, times the expression that I get when I erase the row and the column, this time that A3 is in, 
and compute the wedge product of the terms before. What I get is a number times e1, e2, e3. This number times e1, e2, e3. In summary then, we compute this determinant of this matrix with three by three entries. From that first row, we expand it with respect to the first vector, and it's going to give me a plus a1 times the matrix that's left underneath when I raise row and column, minus a2 times the matrix underneath that results from erasing the row and column a2 is in, plus a3 times the determinant of the matrix left over when I erase the row and column that a3 is in. This is going to generalize. So the plus and minus pattern will come up again. That plus and minus pattern will be maintained, and I'll show you that expression in section two. For right now, let's introduce the definition of the determinant, therefore. I have my vectors a1 through ak. I'm expressing them in terms of, let's say, the standard basis e1 through ek, so the same number of vectors. And when I do the computation, when I wedge the a1, a2 through ak together, I'll get a single number times e1, e2, ek. I'll get that the hypervolume defined by the vectors a is equal to some number times the hypervolume of our reference e1, wedge e2, wedge ek. That number is the determinant of that hypervolume, is the hypervolume with respect to our reference uh, hypervolume. And for the standard base, that's a unit hypercube. Let's look at the computation of the determinant now, and I'll write it down recursively. For a single entry, for a matrix of size 1 by 1, the vector isn't changing, the determinant is simply that number A. For a 2 by 2 matrix, the pattern was A1 times a race row and column A1 is in the determinant of B2, minus a2 erase the row and column that a2 is in the determinant of b1 so a1 b2 minus a2 b1 where i've used the previous definition to simplify those determinants for a three by three determinant i have a1 a2 a3 with an alternating sign pattern so plus a1 minus a2 plus a3 times the determinant that is left for a1 after I raise the row and column that a1 is in, for what multiplies a2, the row and column that a2 is in, and similarly for a3. For a 4x4 four four matrix, it's again the same pattern. Plus a1, a minus a2, a plus a3, a minus a4, multiplied by the determinant that's left when I erase, say for a3, when I erase the row and column that a3 is in. And for larger matrices, this same pattern just continues. For an example with a 3 by 3 matrix, here's my matrix 1, 2, 4, 0, 1, 3, 2, minus 1, 0. And I look at my first row. So it's plus 1, minus 2, plus 4, plus 1, minus 2, plus 4. And for plus 1, erase the row and column that the 1 is in. So the determinant of 1, 3, minus 1, 0. For minus 2, erase the row and column that that 2 is in, and I get the determinant of 0, 3, 2, 0. Then plus 4 for 4, again we erase row and column and get the remaining determinant, and compute each one of these determinants with, with the 2 by 2 formula. So plus 1 times 1 times 0, minus, minus 1 times 3, so 0 plus 3. Minus 2 times the determinant, 0 times 0, minus 2 times 3, so 0 minus 6. And for 4, it's 0 times minus 1, minus 1 times 2, so 0 minus 2. And finishing the arithmetic, the overall result is 7. Let's think about the wedge product one more time and see the following. That if I take a1 wedge a2 wedge a n, if I interchange the rows in my matrix, all that happens to the determinant is it changes the sign. Interchanging A1 and A2 would correspond to moving a row in the matrix, but in so doing, I pick up a minus sign. 
So rather than physically moving a row in the matrix, I simply adjust the sign pattern by adding that minus sign. So in the first row, I had plus one, minus one, plus one, minus one. In the second row, interchanging row one and row two, that minus sign will therefore give me minus one, plus one, minus one, plus one. If I move the first row down into the third row, or if I move the third row up instead, well, keep the third row in place, it's two minus signs, so I'm back to plus one, minus one, plus one, etc. So depending on the row that I pick, I have alternating sign patterns, and uh, a formula for that sign pattern is just minus one to the power of the row plus the column. First row plus first column, one plus one is two, an even power, so plus one. This entry here is in the third row, second column, so three plus two is five, is an odd number, minus one to the power of five is minus one. I get this checkerboard of signs. So I can use different rows. It turns out I can also use different columns. That also comes from a systematic expansion of the wedge product with similar arguments. And the result is that, first of all, the sign pattern stays the same whether I pick a row or a column. And that algebraically, when I think about, well, I will expand about a column instead of a row, that amounts to saying that the determinant of the transpose of the matrix is equal to the determinant of A. If you think in terms of volumes, at first it's rather surprising. Here, geometrically, if I take the first column, 5, 4, and the second column, 2, minus 3, and then take the transpose of that matrix, the second set of vectors are 5, 2, and 4, minus 3. And my theorem says that the gray area has the same area is the tan area. Now, when you think about it a little bit, geometrically, what it amounts to is slides. Take the opposite side to vector 2 minus 3 and slide it along itself until the 5, 4 vector points in the same direction as the 5, 2 vector, and then do the same thing for the second vector, for the second side. Two slides are going to move that gray area into the tan area and geometrically, that indeed works out to determinant of a transpose, the tan area, is equal to the determinant of the original matrix A, is equal to the gray area. A 4x4 four four example of how such an expansion might go is that I'm going to pull rows and columns that I like out of my matrix. So here's my 4x4 four four matrix, and let's say I like the second row for some reason. It's got two zeros in it and therefore that will simplify my computation. The sign pattern plus minus. So zero has a minus sign, one has a plus sign, three a minus sign, zero plus sign. So it's minus zero plus one minus three plus zero. And let's see, for the zero term, erase the row and column that zero is in, that leaves me two, four, three, zero minus one, zero, one, zero, zero. For the one term, erase the row and column that the one is in, that leaves me the matrix 1, 4, 3, 2 minus 1, 0, 1, 0, 0, and similarly for the remaining two matrices. Now, this time I have four determinants to compute. Let's look at the first one. Even though I know it's zero, I could say, well, uh, if I were to compute that 3 by 3 matrix, which row or column might I use? Well, if I use the third row, 1, 0, 0, I see that only the 1 is going to contribute. So 1 times the determinant of 4, 3, minus 1, 0, although I won't compute it because I'm already multiplying it by 0. For the second matrix, again, if I look, I might like that third row, and therefore plus, minus, plus, it's plus 1 times the determinant of 4, 3, minus 1, 0. So plus 1 times 0 plus 3, for the next matrix, I might like the third column because it's got two zeros. It's only going to contribute to three times the matrix two zero one one. So minus nine times two minus zero. And for the last one, well, I might pick the last row, but it's already multiplied by zero, so no computation required there. The overall determinant when I finish the computation here is minus 15. Some easy determinants. 
Suppose I have a matrix and I see a column of zeros in this case. Well, with a column of zeros, I'll choose that column to expand. So it's going to be zero times a matrix of an array of rows and columns, plus zero, plus zero, plus zero. The determinant is going to be zero. It would work exactly the same for a row. In fact, that the determinant of A transpose equals the determinant of A, that theorem tells me that whatever I say about rows, I can also say about columns and vice versa. So a row of zeros, determinant is equal to zero. Therefore, a column of zeros, the determinant is equal to zero. Now, the next example is here. Look at that third column. That third column, if you compare to the first and second column, you might notice that that's just the sum of the first column and the second column. 1 plus 2 is 3, 4 plus 2 is 6, 8 plus 2 is 10, 4 plus 1 is 5. Whenever I have that, if I transcribe that into matrix form, and this time from the transpose, I'll simply use 1, 4, 8, 4 as the first vector, 2, 2, 2, 1 as the second vector. The third vector is the sum of the first and the second vector. But we know from that filter property that those contributions will get filtered out. The determinant of a matrix where I have a linear combination of, uh, say, two columns giving me another column, that has to add up to zero. So again, if I notice that, I have no computation to do, that determinant will be zero. Diagonal matrices. Well, if my matrix is diagonal, it's got entries only on the diagonal, everything else is zero, I might fancy the first column. The first column says it's three times the remaining matrix, but the remaining matrix is diagonal again. So let's pull out the first column again. So it will be five times the remaining matrix. The remaining matrix is diagonal again. It will be two times the remaining matrix. Overall, I'm going to get a product of the diagonal terms. The determinant of this diagonal matrix is going to be three times five times two times minus one, which multiplies out to minus 30. So the product of a diagonal matrix is the product of the diagonal entries. I can generalize that to triangular matrix. So for example, here I wrote a lower triangular matrix, and this time around, I'll fancy the first row. It's three times the remaining matrix, but that remaining matrix is lower triangular. Again, I'll pull the first row. It's five times the remaining matrix. It's necessarily lower triangular again. In this instance, it happens to be a diagonal because there happens to be a zero here. But the net effect again is that it's going to be the product of the diagonal entries. So 3 times 5 times 2 times minus 1. Again, this multiplies out to minus 30. So the determinant of a triangular matrix, whether it's upper triangular or lower triangular, is simply the product of the diagonal elements. You may have noticed that these last two examples, the diagonal matrix is a scaling matrix in our Gaussian elimination. A triangular matrix is one of those matrices that we use to put zeros in appropriate places. Those matrices are triangular if you look at them. The row exchange matrix also occurs in Gaussian elimination. So let's see what happens when I exchange a single row. Look at the matrix wherever the one is on the diagonal. I fancy say, the column where the one is on the diagonal is one times what's left over. And again, that has ones on the diagonal, let's say a column here that's left over. After I erase all the ones on the diagonal, I'm going to be left with a matrix 0, 1, 1, 0, and that multiplies out to minus 1. The permutation matrix that interchanges two rows and only two rows always has determinant equal to minus 1. If it interchanges more than two rows, well, I'm going to pick up a minus 1 for each row interchange I have to do. So a permutation matrix in general will have either plus 1 or minus 1. Now, we seem to have an algorithm to compute the determinant of a matrix, but I've got some bad news. It's actually not really feasible. If I look at the number of multiplications that I have to do for a matrix of size n by n, it's n factorial multiplications. And n factorial grows very, very quickly. For a matrix of 5 by 5, 
it's already 120 multiplications. So I'm in the hundreds. By hand, I will not want to do a 5 by 5 matrix unless it has a lot of zeros in it, unless I can drop a lot of terms out of those 120. By the time I get to a 10 by 10 matrix, I'm already at 3.6 million. Make it 15 by 15, I'm now at a trillion multiplication. That number is so large that your typical laptop even if it could handle it in terms of memory, which it can't, in terms of time, it would take forever. So overall then, for larger matrices, we need a better algorithm. N equals three, okay, I'll do that. Three factorial is just six, six multiplications I can handle. Four, four factorial is 24, okay, that's pushing it already. Our takeaway then is that we introduced this wedge product, and we defined it in such a way that it captures the notion of computing a hypervolume associated with a set of vectors, that the K blades that resulted from it, I can think of as oriented hyperplanes. So A wedge B is a plane that contains the vectors A and B. A wedge B wedge C is a three space that contains the three vectors in 3D. The wedge product is very closely related to the cross product. That the cross product also computes an area of two vectors and a corresponding orthogonal vector, and that orthogonal vector is what makes a, a cross product useless in other than three dimensions. The determinant then is just the hypervolume that we get from that wedge product with respect to a reference hypervolume. And the transcription of that wedge product into looking at what happens to entries in a square matrix gave us the Laplace expansion computation. We looked at some simple matrices and among others, they included all three types of simple matrices that we see in Gaussian elimination, namely elimination matrices, the ones that put zeros in. If we look at them, they're unit lower triangular. They have ones on the diagonal and the only non-zero entries are below the diagonal, so they have determinant one. The row exchange matrices we have been using exchange two rows only, and therefore they have determinant minus one. And the scaling matrices, scaling the pivots, those are diagonal matrices, and therefore have determinant equal to the product of the scale factor.